This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life is unpredictable. Good times and bad times can come out of nowhere and take you by surprise. Going to therapy and learning how to manage your thoughts is like a secret weapon that prepares you for any challenge. Try it out at betterhelp.com super. What if Harry Potter never called the night bus and Sirius Black had revealed himself to Harry that night and told him everything. As it stands, Harry does see Sirius that night, but the circumstances and timing are about as unfortunate as possible. He only sees him as the large black dog, and about a day later discovers the Grimm, typically represented by a large black dog, is a death omen, and then a few weeks later that an escaped murderer is likely out to kill him. It all fits together so well, and fear of Sirius Black looms over the castle for the entire book. But of course, it's all a huge misdirect a misunderstanding. The real culprit is Ron's rat, Scabbers, aka Peter Pettigrew. He was the true secret keeper that gave up Harry's parents to Voldemort and framed Sirius for murder. Unfortunately, this information comes to light with equally poor timing. Just as Sirius is on the cusp of being proven innocent, Peter escapes and reunites with Voldemort. But all of that is thrown into question if the night bus never appears and Sirius had met up with Harry and explained everything that night. Would Sirius have been proven innocent? Would Voldemort ever have risen back to power without Peter? And and would Harry have ever learned to cast a Patronus without the Dementors present at the school? Hey brother, hope you're all having a super day and welcome to What If Harry Never Called the Night Bus. Okay, so first and foremost, the very worst thing about Harry not calling the night bus is that we get no interactions with Stan Shunpike. What you fell over for? On the plus side, we also don't get any interactions with that weird drinking head thing, so. Yeah, tickets are wearing it. But hey, that's not what this video is about. The real question is, what if Sirius makes contact with Harry in this moment? Now, as a refresher, Harry normally only even barely sees Sirius. The garage door gleamed, and between them, Harry saw quite distinctly the hulking outline of something very big with wide gleaming eyes. So I guess question one is, how would Harry react to Sirius in this moment? Because remember, he also did just flee the Dursleys, and as this happens, he's in the process of planning his life on the run. His temper is high, his wand is out, and he has actually already heard about Sirius Black, albeit through the lens of the muggle news. The public is warned that Black is armed and extremely dangerous. A special hotline has been set up, and any sighting of Black should be reported immediately. Yeah, it's like my British newscaster voice. Nonetheless, though, I imagine Sirius just transforms into himself, arms raised, and says, something like, Harry, goodness, it's you. I haven't seen you since you were a baby. You look so much like your father, except for your eyes. Who are you? Says Harry, wants to raise. My name is Sirius Black. I knew your parents, and I'm your godfather. And in these words, Harry is, of course, dumbfounded. He recognizes the name and even the picture of Sirius from the news. But on the other hand, he's intrigued by the idea that this man knew his parents and is a possible other caretaker. Especially since he just, you know, abandoned the Dursleys seemingly forever, as far as he's concerned. And let's be real, when Sirius was on the Muggle News, Vernon was all like, no need to tell us he's no good, which is really probably a point in Sirius's favor in Harry's book. I can explain everything, Harry. I don't know what you've heard about me since you re-entered the wizarding world, but we should get out of the light. At the moment, I'm wanted for a terrible crime, but I'm innocent and I could use your help to prove it. Harry, of course, agrees to hear Sirius out, who can then easily explain everything to Harry right then and there, especially without any of the weird complications of like Lupin or Snape constantly just barging in or Peter wriggling in Ron's hands over in the corner the whole time. Which means this moment right here is actually when Harry first learns about the Fidelius charm, the secret keepers, first ever learns about Pettigrew or Lupin or that his father was an Animagus. And now you might think that even with the story, Harry's first instinct might not be to trust this random formerly dog person he just met on the street. I mean, after all, his first impression of him is still as an escaped convict. But don't forget, even in the main story when Harry has Sirius at one point and is utterly convinced that Sirius is the one who turned on his parents, he still can't bring himself to do any harm to him. And it's just the suggestion that Sirius is innocent and requesting Harry hear him out that stops Harry from doing anything. So yeah, I think Harry hears him out, definitely shows him mercy and believes him. But so then what do I do from here? Because actually at that moment, the ministry would be out looking for not just Sirius, but also Harry. 
Classic. And we know they're gonna be pretty nearby because we know they sent someone to the Dursleys to deflate Aunt Marge. Hopefully after like, like a while. Well, what Harry and Sirius should probably do is immediately clear out of that particular area and then try and get a letter to Dumbledore. I think even Harry could reason out that they shouldn't write to the ministry about this matter because they would just show up and arrest, in Harry's mind, probably himself for inflating Marge and also Sirius for, in their minds, committing murder and escaping prison. Unfortunately though, Harry doesn't have Hedwig with him at the moment because he sent her to the Weasleys so that they wouldn't tip off Aunt Marge to Harry's, you know, magicalness. You know how it is. You see someone with an owl and you're like, well, you're a wizard. When of course in reality, whenever you see someone with an owl, you're probably more like, where did you get that owl? Speaking of the Weasleys though, I think the burrow probably is where Harry and Sirius do set out for. I mean, for one, that's where Hedwig is, but for two, Sirius's explanation to Harry about how he was innocent would include showing him the clipping from the newspaper where he can see Peter on Ron's shoulder, and Harry would of course be like, hey, I know them, they're like my best friends. What are the freaking odds, man? Seriously. What are the odds? But the next question is, what did they do when they get to the burrow? Because while it's obviously a safe place for Harry, it is also where Pettigrew is. And if he gets even a whiff that Sirius is in the area, he is 100% gonna book it. And honestly, a couple things could happen. Like Sirius could just completely lose it, knowing he's this close to Peter and goes in and immediately tries to kill him. Which like if he does, he probably just ends up going right back to Azkaban, which is not so great for him. But I doubt he would do that that because he would be with Harry this time and it's Harry himself who suggests that he not kill Peter because then he won't be able to prove his innocence and Harry more than anyone wants Sirius to be alive and innocent so that he doesn't have to live with the Dursleys. So the plan is Sirius you stay in the woods, Harry you go inside and get a letter from Hedwig to Dumbledore explain everything. The problem is the ministry is out looking for Harry just as much as they're looking for Sirius and the moment he shows up at the Weasleys where someone from the ministry works, they are going to be like all over it. Like it would not surprise me if suddenly the Weasley's house had like a ton of protection to try and prevent, you know, Sirius himself from getting to Harry. But this actually ends up working out in Harry and Sirius's favor because as long as the house is under extra protection from Sirius, Peter is gonna feel extra safe and not go anywhere, giving Harry time to send an owl to Dumbledore. And it doubly works out because then Dumbledore is gonna show up and ask to examine Ron's rat. And when he does, boom, Peter is revealed and completely surrounded by all the guards. Which, yay, Peter is caught, he's sent to Azkaban and Sirius's name is cleared and I guess he he probably has to finally register that he's an animagus now, so whatever. From there, I imagine Sirius goes ahead and moves back into Grimald Place and that Molly also helps him clean it as usual and that they have a much better working friendship this time because normally what they're fighting about all the time is Harry and the Order of the Phoenix, but the Order of the Phoenix isn't even around yet. In fact, on that note, will the Order ever be around? I mean, with Peter and Azkaban, Will Voldemort ever have a servant return to him and return to power? Unfortunately, yes, I do think Voldemort still does come back anyway. I mean, even if it's not Peter who joins back up with him, the prophecy is still in play. Neither can live while the other survives and all that jazz. But more on that in a minute. In the meantime, the bigger question is, if Sirius is back and he's Harry's godfather, does that mean Harry doesn't have to live with the Dursleys anymore? And the answer is, Maybe. See, when Voldemort fails to kill Harry, it allows Dumbledore to put a charm on Harry that goes kind of like this. While you can still call home the place where your mother's blood dwells, there you cannot be touched or harmed by Voldemort. You need return there only once a year, but as long as you can still call it home, there he cannot hurt you. So it's sort of an odd charm. Like arguably Harry could and should still return there for at least like one night a year just to keep the charm alive. But it only protects him if he can call that place home. And even then only while he's there. So like if he's only there for one night, can he really call it home? And if he's not there anyway, is the protection any good? Maybe it's still good as like a last resort safe house, I suppose. I can certainly see a situation where Dumbledore just insists that he stays with the Dursleys so that he is like always either at the Dursleys and safe from Voldemort or at Hogwarts where Dumbledore can watch over him. But given the fact that Voldemort hasn't returned yet and there's such a better option in play and it's specifically the person Harry's parents wanted to guard over him if they died, I think they just go ahead and go with Grimald Place and just put a ton of protections on that house. 
house. Which, hey, that's what happens in the main story anyway. And guys, now we need to take a quick pause to thank today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Because like, no joke, one of the best days every month is when our new box of awesome from Bespoke Post arrives. Like my last haul was the Terra box, which came with this great bare bones knife and multi-tool. This thing is so cool. It has a serrated edge, a smooth edge, a pommel base that can be used as a hammer and a twine cutting notch that also works as a bottle opener. I mean, seriously, just look at this thing. Also, it comes with this lovely sheath. Like not only does it look awesome, but it's also just practical to use. You can use it for like digging in your garden or measuring stuff out while you're camping. And did I mention how awesome it looks? And that's what makes Bespoke Post one of our favorite brands to work with because every item is truly unique. They're hand curated from small businesses with both form and function in mind. And don't worry, if you don't find yourself in the need for like a giant knife, they've still got you covered. They've got cozy goods, they've got home essential goods, they've got travel goods, they have got you covered. Plus they have new boxes every month, so you're always getting something new and fun and interesting. And if you head over to boxofawesome.com, you can actually take a quiz to help narrow in on exactly what is the right box for you. Plus with each box of awesome, you are supporting a small business and it's free to sign up and you can cancel or skip a month at any time. So get 20% off your first monthly box when you head over to boxofawesome.com and use promo code super at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, promo code super at checkout for 20% off. One more time, boxofawesome.com, promo code super at checkout for 20% off your first monthly box. Link is in the description down below. In any case though, Sirius being innocent and free has some other interesting ramifications on the story as well. Firstly, since the Dementors won't be at the school hunting for Sirius, Harry won't really encounter them at all this year and thus won't end up learning how to do the Patronus charm from Lupin. And speaking of Lupin, I have to imagine that Harry just starts the year knowing right away that Lupin is a werewolf. I mean, given that Lupin is like Sirius's best living friend and it's part of his whole story about why he's innocent. Uh, I, yeah, I definitely think he just tells him about it. On that note though, and I think this would be awesome with Lupin as their teacher and Sirius around to encourage Harry and no active looming threat over the school this year and the working memory that Harry's father could transform into an animal. I definitely think Harry, Ron and Hermione take it upon themselves to become Animagus. Cool. And what would they be, you ask? Well, I think for simplicity's sake, they'd probably just match their Patronuses, meaning Harry would, just like his dad, be a stag, Ron would be a terrier, Hermione would be an otter, and Neville would be a goldfish. Come on, Neville. Oh my God, come on, dude. No, I'm just kidding. It's probably just the three of them. Neville's already really bad at transfiguration anyway. And surprisingly, he can't produce a Patronus either. So yeah, that was just a joke that he would be a goldfish because it'd just be funny. Why is it always me? Is that, that smiles back. Long bottom. For what it's worth, I don't think your Patronus and your Animagus form are always like a one-to-one -one thing like that. Like there's no way Snape's Animagus form would be a doe, right? Like he's definitely a bat six ways to Sunday. And I don't think your Animagus form can be like a magical creature. So like Dumbledore wouldn't turn into a phoenix. Although that's a good question. What do you think his Animagus form would be? Personally, I'm leaning. Honeybee. Anyway though, getting back on track, because of the jinx Voldemort puts on the defense against the dark arts position, we know Lupin definitely still isn't gonna last past a year. So at some point it is still pretty likely that he transforms in a very unwelcoming way, or at least that everyone just finds out he's a werewolf. But really him turning into the wolf and Harry, Ron and Hermione having to fight him off in their animal forms while Neville flops uselessly, <laughs> I'm gonna get it. Ugh. But really Lupin turning into the wolf and Harry, Ron and Hermione having to fight him off in their new awesome animal forms while Neville flops uselessly as a goal. But really, Lupin turning into a wolf and Harry, Ron, and Hermione having to fight him off in their awesome new animal forms while Neville flops uselessly as a goldfish over in the corner feels like the new climax for book three, doesn't it? Honestly, I just love the idea of like Lupin and three transformed students roaming the grounds again, though. That just sounds fun, like the Marauders Reborn. But where does that leave Voldemort? Well, there's an argument to be made that Trelawney's second prophecy, the one she makes before Harry in the North Tower during their divination exam, is still in play. That's the one saying that Peter is going to escape and reunite with Voldemort before midnight. But I dare say, since the events leading up to that moment are so different, that that prophecy likely just doesn't happen. However, Voldemort must still return at some point, and Sirius 
isn't the only person who's broken out of Azkaban. Because as usual, there's still Voldemort's actual other best supporter, Barty Crouch Jr. Constantly but slowly fighting off his father's imperious curse, waiting for the day when he can break free and rejoin his master. And here's where I think things could be kind of interesting. Usually it's serious seeing Peter in the paper that prompts everything into motion. And actually I think the same would be true this time. Because after Peter is captured and sent to Azkaban, no doubt the ministry is going to be tooting its own horn, shouting loudly that they have captured Voldemort's truest and closest supporter, the one genuinely responsible for the Potter's deaths. And you can just imagine how this news is gonna hit old Barty Crouch Jr. Peter Pettigrew, the Dark Lord's greatest supporter. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. Somebody hold my poly juice. I'll show you how it's done. Actually, I'm gonna need this. Now that said, you might think without Peter being there to, you know, charm it up with old Bertha Jorkins, they might not be able to get enough information about the Triwizard Tournament to get Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire. But don't forget, Barty Crouch Jr.'s dad is the one organizing the event, and if they put him under the Imperius curse like they usually do, I'm thinking they have all the information they need. So Harry probably still ends up in the Triwizard Tournament, but likely has a much easier go of figuring out what to do for each task since he can just ask Sirius for help. Sirius, who I have to imagine very early on just gives Harry the two-way mirror, but actually explains how it works rather than being super vague and getting his own self killed. That means Harry probably uses the conjunctivitis curse against the Hungarian Horntail. Sirius can probably pretty easily tell him about either the Bubblehead Charm or Gillyweed. Plus Neville could transform into a goldfish ahead of time and like scout it out, you know? And then the maze probably isn't that different, except that Harry can, you know, turn into a stag. So maybe he has a much easier go against the spiders. I mean, how awesome would that be? Harry comes up against the Acromantulas and just like gores one with his antlers. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't say the chance. Either way though, Voldemort's plan works and he manages to return after the tournament. Meaning the Order of the Phoenix has to be reestablished, although their headquarters probably isn't at Grimwald Place this time since now it's where Harry is living. Not sure where Dumbledore would set up HQ instead, like maybe the burrow? Seems like a good excuse for Harry to still be all around like Ron and Hermione, but then also like be really excluded from all the meetings. Sirius, I have to imagine though, being innocent becomes a way more effective member of the Order of the Phoenix. I mean, think how effective he would be not only as a skilled wizard, but as an Animagus. Either way, Voldemort is probably still going after the prophecy, but I doubt he's gonna be able to lure Harry there this time because for one, Harry knows how the two-way mirrors work this time. But for two, if Harry and Sirius have like all this extra free time together, there's just like no way Sirius doesn't tell Harry about the prophecy. Like he doesn't know the contents, but just that there is a prophecy and that Voldemort wants it and might try and lure you there. This all would have been really useful information. I feel like Sirius would have told Harry. Meaning Voldemort's just gonna have to steal it the old fashioned way by himself, which is probably what he should have done the first time around. I mean, literally an entire group of Death Eaters breaks in undetected and gets to the exact spot you need to be to steal the prophecy. And then Voldemort shows up in the ministry later that night, like, what the heck, dude? Bellatrix is all like, what? The Dark Lord show up at the ministry when they're going out of their way to tell everyone he's not back? <laughs> oh, wait, he's upstairs. But here's the twist. Because Sirius is such a more active member of the Order of the Phoenix, he is able to uncover the date Voldemort himself is going to be in the ministry to try and steal the prophecy. And so the Order stages a trap. Big battle ensues. Spells are flying everywhere. Sirius sees an opening to attack Voldemort and he cannot resist an attack on Big Baldy himself. <sighs> but he's also no match. So sadly, as usual, even though it's not Bellatrix and instead Voldemort, I think Sirius still goes down that night. I know it's sad and tragic, but just like his parents and Cedric and Hedwig and Lupin and Lavender Brown, these are all people that are necessary to die so that Harry has what it takes to walk into the woods and make the ultimate sacrifice at the end. Okay, strictly speaking, Lavender Brown, not necessary to this situation. Maybe Lavender survives this time around. There, there you go. That's your silver lining. Or well, I guess Lavender lining, brown lining. <laughs> But there you go, guys. That's 
everything that happens if Harry fails to call the night bus and Sirius tells him everything that night. Honestly, I was kind of surprised by this one. It's always sort of felt like, man, if Sirius could have just talked to him right then and there, they could have captured Peter and Voldemort would have never returned. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had that exact conversation with other people, but everyone always forgets about Barty Crouch Jr. And the fact that the prophecy is still immovably in play. Plus, no matter what, Voldemort still has like a mountain of horcruxes just anchoring him to life. So at some point, almost no matter what, he's coming back. But guys, I hope you're having a super year so far. If you want to see another What If video from us, I recommend our What If Harry Was in Slytherin series. You can check that out by clicking this video right here. But otherwise, Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.